Uh, my lord, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Bob Spence, uh, welcoming you on behalf of the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering and the City and Guilds College Association to the ninth Peter Lindsay Memorial Lecture. Who was Peter Lindsay? Well, originally from Poland and known as uh, Bolesław Wodzow, he escaped Nazi tyranny in 1940 by the Tatra Mountains and made his way by a necessarily circuitous route to Scotland, um, as described in your brochure by his friend Dr. Harmlink. Uh, he later gained his doctorate under the, uh, at this college and under his adopted name, and for me more easily pronounced, of Peter Lindsay, he uh, began a very successful career, uh, as also described in your brochure by his professional colleague, Alan Reddish. Now, Peter made a very generous bequest that supports this annual lecture, but also uh, supports current students in need. Details of that student support uh, can be viewed at the website of the CGCA Charitable Trust. The awards range from vital financial support for sudden student hardship to initiatives such as cycling in Mongolia, uh, presumably in practice for doing the same thing here in London. Uh, now tonight we have reached the ninth Peter Lindsay Memorial Lecture. Our speaker this evening is the Lord Rees of Ludlow. Among many other activities, he has recently performed as the President of the Royal Society and as Astronomer Royal, and he was appointed Order of Merit by Her Majesty the Queen. There are many other roles that he's performed with distinction, but I shall not tell you about them. First, because you can read about them in the brochure, and secondly, because you've come here to listen to him, not to me. So for that reason, I shall not delay the pleasure in inviting Lord Rees to present the ninth Peter Lindsay Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Spence. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here um, and uh, to talk to you about uh, the universe. Uh, astronomy is the oldest science, except perhaps for medicine. And at the risk of annoying any doctors here, I'd say it was the first to do more good than harm. <laughs> it's the granite environmental science. Everyone has looked up at the night sky uh, and wondered at it throughout human history. Um, but it's also a fundamental science because we can study extreme physics in the cosmos that we couldn't reproduce in a lab. And since I'm addressing uh, uh, engineers here to a substantial extent, I want to start off by saying that astronomy and space science depends very much on engineering. Pure thought won't get you very far. We're no wiser than Aristotle. And 95% of what we've achieved is due to technology and engineering. I like this wonderful old cartoon you may have seen, which shows two beavers looking up at a hydroelectric dam. And one is saying to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, with all modesty, is the role of theorists in astronomy compared to those who design the uh, magnificent gizmos on which progress depends. I want to start with a bit of history with Sir Isaac Newton. He thought about many things, but he thought about space travel. This is a picture from the English edition of his great book, Principia. It shows cannonballs being found, fired from a mountaintop. And uh, as you can see, and as he realized, if it's fired fast enough, then it curves downwards, no more steep than the Earth curves away underneath it. It goes into orbit. This is still, I think, the neatest way to explain to students the concept of orbital flight. And he calculated that to go into a circular orbit, 
the cannonball has to be fired at 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond, of course, what was then possible. And it wasn't until 1957 that the uh, Soviet Sputnik was the first man-made object to achieve orbit, followed a year later by a dog, and three years after that by uh, Yuri Gagarin. Uh, some people may be old enough to remember this, and he came to uh, London and was mobbed by tourists, and um, uh, Macmillan, who was then the prime minister, a rather sardonic man, said that the uh, mobbing would have been twice as bad if they'd sent the dog, and uh, if they didn't. <laughs> Well, after Gagarin, uh, the uh, American Apollo program got going, and we had, just about seven years after Gagarin, uh, this picture still iconic among environmentalists, showing the uh, fragile biosphere of the Earth as seen from uh, uh, an orbit around the moon. And then we had Neil Armstrong's One Small Step, and I treasure this picture signed for me a few years ago by uh, seven of the Apollo astronauts. Neil Armstrong didn't sign, but I once gave a lecture where he was sitting in the front row, seemingly taking notes, but maybe doing the crossword. I don't know, but it was a great honor to have him there. Well, of course, many people here are far too young to remember when people walked on the moon. It's more than 40 years ago. Uh, it's ancient history, just like the Egyptians building the pyramids and the Americans going to the moon. But, of course, since that time, hundreds of people have orbited the Earth in orbit, uh, Helen Sharman here went up in the uh, Russian space station, and many more have been in the International Space Station here. But people have no, not been back any further. Nonetheless, unmanned space travel, unmanned space technology has burgeoned. We depend on it every day for sat nav, weather forecasting, navigation, all the rest. And unmanned probes have been to the planets of our solar system, beaming back pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. So let's imagine we make a journey going out from the Earth. If you look back from, uh, say, five million miles, you will see something like that. Um, is it possible to lower the lights a bit so that the slide shows a bit better? Um, and so this shows the, uh, uh, the Earth and the Moon uh, with the Sun coming from the right. Then you would get to the red planet, Mars, and of course many space probes have been to Mars, sending back pictures like this from ESA's Mars Express, and here's a huge gorge several miles deep on Mars. Three years ago, NASA's Curiosity probe, about the size of a small car, uh, went to uh, Mars uh, and is crawling around its surface. It uh, landed uh, in the top left of this picture, the little, little oval is, um, in this huge crater and it's sending back views uh, like this of the walls of the crater, and it's going to uh, explore the uh, geology over many um, years. And then it shows up very well, but to, near the bottom here, you can see the, the, the track marks of Curiosity trundling across the Martian surface. It's traveled about 30 miles so far, and it'll be there for a few more years. Well, beyond Mars, the next planet we come to is Jupiter, the giant of the solar system, with its m many moons, the four big moons known since Galileo's time, which are all very different. Here's Io, sulfurous and volcanic. Here's Europa, covered in very thick ice with perhaps liquid underneath it. And here's a close-up of some of the ice that's clearly been disturbed. Beyond Jupiter, we come to Saturn with his rings here. And this is a rather nice picture. This shows an eclipse of the sun by Saturn. The Cassini spacecraft, in which Imperial College has had an important role, um, is uh, taking this picture, and it's, at this point, beyond Saturn, lined up so that Saturn just covers the image of the sun, but the sun is still shining on the rings. And there, at the end of an hour, you can't quite see it, it's the Earth. It's a very long way away, taken in this picture. Now, the moons of Saturn are fascinating, and Titan was studied in particular by a European probe called Huygens, which was launched from the cargo bay of Cassini and was supposed to do what's shown in this picture. Titan has an atmosphere, and it was supposed to uh, uh, go down and land on the surface. People didn't know what the surface was. But it did that. Here are some pictures. Left and center, 
picture's taken on the way down, write a picture where it landed. Well, it looks uh, rather nice there with rivers and little lake, but the rivers are liquid methane, and the temperature is minus 160 degrees centigrade, so very, very cold there. And here's another picture in false colors of some of the lakes on Titan. A fascinating place. Another fascinating moon of Saturn is Enceladus, much smaller. This has um, ice on it, rather thinner ice, and uh, hot steam and vents is coming out. And one of the most wonderful experiments done recently, again involving uh, uh, a group here, uh, was to uh, uh, steer Cassini. So it went within about 30 miles of the surface and went through one of these vents to actually see the chemical composition of it. And one of the most likely candidates for life in the solar system might be something swimming around under this ice. Other recent highlights of space exploration of the solar system. Uh, in July last year, um, the uh, New Horizons probe went to Pluto. And here are some pictures of Pluto here. And this is a picture of Pluto and its moon, Charon. And this is rather amazing because the technology of this uh, probe was, is 15 years out of date. It was planned five years before launch. It was 10 years on its journey. And it's sending back from a distance 10,000 times further away than the moon pictures like this. Amazing technology. Another piece of amazing technology, again, 15 years out of date, uh, was the uh, uh, Rosetta um, uh, project of the European Space Agency. It took out a comet. Here it is. And here is the uh, Rosetta um, uh, probe, which uh, Philae, which landed on the surface of a comet. Again, robotic technology, but this is 15 years out of date. We can do much better now. Well, if we look a few decades ahead, then I think we can foresee that all the solar system is going to be explored by huge numbers of miniature robotic probes, a whole flotilla of them sending back far more detailed pictures than the ones we have now. And I think also there'll be huge uh, um, robotic fabricators building huge structures up in space, uh, huge mirrors for radio astronomy, maybe solar energy, out of the uh, Earth's gravity where we could build very large lightweight structures. I think that'll happen. But what about the role of human beings? This is Harrison Schmidt, one of the last two men on the moon. And uh, uh, since then, no one has been back. Are people going to follow the robots? Well, the trouble is that as robots advance, the uh, gap between what a robot can do and what a human can do, which is still very large, is going to get smaller, whereas the cost difference between sending robots and sending humans, especially if you want to bring them back, is still very high. And that's why I think unless the Chinese, for reasons of prestige, want to have a spectacular program like the American Apollo, and they might, of course, and if they do, they will have to go for Mars, because it wouldn't be a way to assert superpower parity to do what the Americans did 50 years earlier and go to the moon. So the Chinese might go to Mars. But if they don't, then I think, frankly, the future for manned space flights lies really as an adventure rather than of any practical purpose because the robots can do things practically. And I really hope that there will be uh, footprints on Mars um, in the lifetime of many of the younger people here anyway. But I think the people who go will be not NASA-type astronauts, but they will be people prepared to take higher risks than NASA or ESA can impose on civilian publicly funded astronauts. They'll be um, people um, in the mold of um, uh, so Randolph Fiennes dragging a sledge across the Antarctic or the guy who fell supersonically from a balloon. People like that um, who do these crazy things and we cheer them on. Um, and uh, uh, they'll be doing it cheaper because uh, there are private uh, companies, in particular SpaceX, Elon Musk company, uh, which are trying to bring down the cost of launches by uh, uh, recently, for instance, being able to recover the first stage of the launch vehicle. And they will be able to send people into space maybe in a slightly risky way, but much cheaper. There'll be lots of people volunteering. Musk will be sending people into Earth orbit soon. And the next thing will be to send people round the backside of the moon 
going further from Earth than any human beings have ever been, and that's a five-day journey going there and back. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight. Maybe that says something. Um, as regards going to Mars, um, you can go to Mars and go around it and come back. That would take about a year and a half. So the idea of crew there is a stable middle-aged couple, happy to be cooped up for that length of time and old enough that radiation damage doesn't concern them too much. Um, but uh, also there could be uh, people landing on Mars, um, maybe with a one-way ticket to settle there. And Elon Musk himself, who is really a great pioneer of all this, he says that he hopes to die on Mars but not on impact. <laughs> and I think he may make it. He's 44 years old now, I think. So in 40 years from now, this may be a possible aspiration. And I do think that uh, by the end of a century, there will be communities of people living away from the Earth, maybe on Mars, maybe on an asteroid. And that will be important for humanity because uh, um, although um, uh, it's uh, never going to be the case that there will be mass emigration because there's nowhere in the solar system as comfortable as the top of Everest or the South Pole, it will be good that there is a community away from the Earth. And whatever ethical constraints we impose on Earth, we'd surely wish those people out there good luck in using all the techniques of cyborg and genetic modification to adapt to an alien environment. And those techniques will advance. So within two or three centuries, people living away from the Earth will have almost become a new species, evolving through technology, not through Darwinian selection. So the post-human era will start not on Earth, but away from Earth, and I think within a couple of centuries. Well, is there any life out there already before we get there? Well, as I said, there could be something under the ocean of uh, Enceladus. There could even be uh, some uh, strange life on, on Titan. But the promise, the promise doesn't look great, and certainly there's no advanced life in our solar system. But if we widen our horizons to the interstellar realm, to a realm far beyond the reach of any terrestrial uh, probe that we can imagine constructing now, then things are very exciting indeed, because we've now learned that most of the stars you see in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is orbited by planets, uh, including the Earth. The planets are not seen directly. They're inferred by precise measurements of the star they're orbiting around. These measurements are of two kinds, and I'm going to mention them both. The first is depicted here. If you have a planet orbiting a star, then what actually happens is that the planet and the star both orbit the center of mass, what's called the barycenter. The planet goes round in a big orbit, and the star, being much heavier, goes round in a smaller orbit. It's a very asymmetric dumbbell, as it were. But by careful measurements of the uh, spectrum of the star, you can detect a changing Doppler effect as it goes round and round, and measure motions of only meters per second, or even less. And here's an example of that being done. Uh, this shows uh, the um, uh, radial velocity of a star. And this is a sine wave, uh, which indicates a circular orbit. Um, and uh, from this, you can infer the length of the planet's year from the period of this orbit. And you can infer the, uh, the mass of the planet from the amplitude, since you know roughly what the mass of the, sun is, of the star is. So this technique has led to the inference of many hundred planets orbiting other stars. Planets are very common. But this technique only finds big planets, rather like Jupiter and Saturn, the giants of our solar system. It can't find Earth-like planets, because an Earth-like planet induces a jitter of only a few centimeters per second in the motion of its central star, and that's too small to be detected spectroscopically. But there's another method illustrated here. If there's a planet and we're looking in the plane of the orbit and it transits in front of its star, then it'll block out a bit of the starlight. And so if you measure the brightness of the star very carefully, you'll see it dips a bit when the planet moves across in front, dips again next time the planet comes around. Okay. And to take an example, um, if you were looking from a very long way away at the sun going around the Earth, um, the sun's brightness would change by one part in 10,000 because the Earth's about 1% the diameter of the sun, so one in ten to the fourth of the area. <clears throat> and the Kepler spacecraft spent more than three years looking at an area of sky about seven degrees across on the sky 
and measuring the brightness of 150,000 stars to a precision of one part in 100,000, doing it over and over again every hour for each star, looking for effects like that. And it was able to infer that there were lots of planets, to infer their size from the amplitude of the dip and the uh, length of their year. And this is a sort of rather silly depiction of um, uh, how uh, 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 plotting the uh, uh, things they've discovered around many stars. But special interest attaches to planets which are like the Earth, like the Earth in two ways, about the size of the Earth, but more importantly, at a distance from their parent star, such that water doesn't boil away, nor does the water stay frozen all the time. That seems to be Earth-like, and that's the place where you might expect life to have got started. And there are a number of candidates of that kind. And they will be the focus for uh, any attempts to look for life. But um, it's rather frustrating that uh, we found by the Doppler method several hundred planets, and from Kepler about 2,000 planets, some Earth-like. And the most Earth-like one is sh shown here. Um, can we, is there no way to make the lights a bit dimmer? Um, no. OK. Um, well, no, no, um, but anyway, uh, this, the, the, this shows a system inferred by Kepler uh, compared with the solar system. What we'd really like to do, of course, is to image an Earth-like planet. And that's hard. To see how hard, let's imagine that there were some aliens out there with a very big telescope and that they were looking at our solar system. If they were, say, 50 light years away, they would see the sun as an ordinary star. And they'd see the Earth as, in Sega's nice phrase, a pale blue dot lying very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and billions of times fainter, looking for a far fly next to a searchlight, as it were. But if they had a big enough telescope that they could detect the Earth from that distance, they could learn quite a bit about it. Because the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could infer the length of the day, that there were continents and oceans, and maybe something about the vegetation, the seasons, and the climate. Now, we can't do that yet, but that's the kind of thing that we hope we will be doing using the next generation of telescopes. Some in space, like James Webb, but some on the ground. And this is a picture of uh, a telescope which the Europeans um, are going to build in Chile. Um, they're not very imaginative in their nomenclature. It's called the ELT, which stands for Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, and this telescope, uh, they've leveled the mountain top, and uh, they've got the funding to build over the next 12 years or so. It will have a mirror 39 meters across. And that's probably, I guess, about twice the width of this lecture theater. Not one piece of glass, but about 800 pieces of glass in a sort of mosaic. And this instrument will have the combination of resolution in angle and in sensitivity to be able to isolate the spectrum of an Earth-like planet from that of the star it's orbiting around, and thereby answer the questions which the hypothetical aliens, in my analogy, were answering about the Earth. And this would be very exciting. Well, do we expect to find life? This, of course, is the most fascinating question for most people. And uh, it's the most difficult question because, uh, although most people aren't aware of this, we don't know really how life began on the Earth. We understand Darwinian evolution from simple life to complex life, but we don't know what caused the basic transition from complicated biochemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing structures, first things we'd call alive. We don't know. Um, this is a, a question which everyone's known is important, and now there are serious people working on it. So I think within 10 or 20 years, we will know the answer to that. And that answer will tell us two things. First, was it a rare fluke, or would we expect life to originate on any planet, roughly like the Earth, with water and uh, et cetera? And secondly, it'll tell us, is the chemical basis of life, RNA and DNA, very special, or could there be others? Or could there even be non-water-based life? Could there even be life of the kind that might exist on Titan? We don't know. But it's, wor it's worth a search. 
But the second question, of course, is even if it's a simple life, and even if it's widespread, people then ask, what about intelligent life? And we don't know. Because we know that over three and a half billion years on Earth, we've gone from the simplest organisms to the complex biosphere that we are part of today. We don't know how uh, many lucky accidents there were and whether that would be common. So we don't know uh, the likelihood of advanced life. And uh, of course, there are some people who think they know the answer. I get letters and things that happen to, if you're an astronomer royal, you get letters from people who say they've uh, met the aliens and they know all of them. <laughs> there. And uh, I say two things to these people. Uh, first, um, do you really think that if the aliens had come to Earth, they'd just have uh, made a corn circle, met one or two well-known cranks, and gone away again? It doesn't seem very likely. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, I tell these people that they should write to each other and not to me. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, um, although uh, I don't think we've found aliens, or I don't believe in UFOs, they may be out there. And uh, they may be... Uh, uh, something li rather like uh, uh, what we imagine our um, civilization will be like in a few centuries, or I think more likely there'll be something which is uh, post-human and completely inorganic, because I think, uh, although this is a topic for another lecture, um, I think the far future of intelligence um, is going to be um, uh, not uh, the organic uh, wet brains that we have inside our heads, but electronic brains um, which have uh, fewer constraints on their power and processing power, and so I think the most advanced things in the universe will be uh, um, inorganic uh, structures floating in space. And so if we detect anything, it'll be them. Uh, there have been attempts, um, and uh, uh, the most ambitious attempt has, was just launched last year um, by a, a Russian uh, investor called Yuri Milner, and I agreed to chair his advisory group, and they're going to do a very deep search in the radio and optical to try and look for any kind of uh, uh, emission which is not natural, a very narrow band or oddly pulsing radio signal or pulsing optical signal, something like that. Even the optimists don't think the chance is more than 3%, uh, but the uh, stakes are so high that I think everyone is glad that someone in the world is doing this and funding it, and I'm very glad that Yuri Milner is spending his money on this, not on a bigger yacht or a football team, which is what people like him would otherwise be doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, um, the quest for life um, is uh, uh, something which we should uh, pursue because we expect that there will be lots of possible locations for life. Uh, but we don't know what we're looking for, and therefore it's you know, like the, uh, uh, the drunk who looks for his keys under the lamppost because that's where he may find them, not that's where he dropped them necessarily. And so we should look by all possible techniques for anything that isn't natural an emission or an artifact or anything like that. Uh, and uh, the chances are, are small, but it would be so crucial for everyone, not just the scientific community, if we found this evidence. Well, let me now return from the uh, complexities of the biological world to the simplicities of the physical world and say something about stars themselves. This is the um, Eagle Nebula, and this is a place where even now new stars are forming. We see where stars are forming, and we see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in about um, five or six billion years when it flares up. Here's another dying star, and it'll leave behind a white dwarf star. Stars bigger than the sun end their lives more explosively. This is the uh, Crab Nebula, which is the remnant of a star about 10 times as heavy as the sun, which exploded in the year 1054 AD, and Chinese astronomers recorded it. They recorded uh, that a guest star had appeared. This is the records of the court astronomer uh, that uh, this star had appeared and was brighter than the moon for several weeks. And in the center of this object, there is a neutron star, a spinning compact object spinning at 30 revs per second. And that's left behind when stars um, uh, 10 times the sun's mass die. Stars even heavier than, than, than that, end their lives by producing black hole remnants. And I want to come back a bit later to say something else about black holes. But just a word about these supernovae. You may think they're far away and long ago, but if it wasn't for these supernovae, we wouldn't be here, as was first realized by this man, Fred Hoyle. He realized that when a big star is near the end of its life, 
it's got a sort of onion skin structure where it's been fueled by nuclear fusion and the hotter inner layers are processed further up the periodic table. And when it finally explodes, it throws out all this stuff. So it starts off with hydrogen, maybe helium, and it throws it all out and can thereby produce all the elements of the periodic table. And he worked with three other people, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage and uh, Willie Fowler. And this is a picture taken of Willie Fowler's 60th birthday when he was given a model train. Um, and uh, they, uh, they really uh, explored this very elaborate flowchart, which I won't have time to go into, about how pristine hydrogen helium from the early universe is processed through stars. And uh, um, the stars process it, and then they throw it out, and then new stars form. So our solar system formed from material already contaminated by the ejecta from earlier stars. Every atom of carbon inside us was made inside an earlier star. Uh, so we are um, literally the ashes of long dead stars. We feel less romantic. We are the nuclear waste from the fuel that makes stars shine. And this is a wonderful insight uh, that uh, Fred Hoyle and his uh, colleagues developed 50 years ago. So our entire galaxy is a sort of ecological system where gas is being recycled from one generation of stars to the next. But let me now expand our horizons beyond our galaxy um, to, uh, to, to the rest of the universe. If you could get two million light years away and look back at our Milky Way galaxy, it would look like this. This, as you probably know, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a spinning disk viewed obliquely. There's about 100 billion stars going around a central hub. Here's another galaxy face on. <clears throat> and this is a map <clears throat> showing um, the thousand or so galaxies nearest to us out to a distance of a few hundred million light years, and they're grouped together in clusters. Now, galaxies are basically assemblages of uh, stars and gas and maybe some dark matter as well, uh, which are held together by gravity. Um, and uh, they are huge structures. We orbit around in our galaxy once every 200 million years. You might think it's pretty hard to learn much about galaxies because we clearly can't do experiments on them um, as a particle physicist could crash particles together in the accelerator at CERN, and they change very slowly. But we can do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. We can ask the question, what would happen if two galaxies collided? And you get, do the calculation, putting in gravity and gas dynamics, and this sort of thing happens. You get a sort of train wreck where two galaxies fall together. You get tidal plumes, and it'll eventually settle down into an amorphous galaxy again. You look in the sky. This is a real picture of two galaxies. And it's fairly clear, having done simulations like I just showed you, that these two galaxies are dangerously close to each other. They pulled out tidal plumes. And if we came back in 100 million years, they'd probably have merged. And by doing exp numerical experiments like this, we can uh, uh, infer how much dark matter there is in galaxies, etc. And so we do understand quite a lot about galaxies. The other advantage we have over, say, geologists is that we can actually observe the past. We can look very far away. This picture shows an area of sky just a few odd minutes across. It would take 100 patches like this to cover the full moon in the sky. And you wouldn't see anything in this field of view with an ordinary telescope. But a big telescope shows literally hundreds of faint smudges. Each a galaxy, many fully the equal of our own galaxy, but so far away that they appear so weak. And we are looking back to when the universe was about 10% of its present age when we look at these. And we can take some spectra. And let me show this. This is um, a spectrum taken by uh, a group at Imperial College of, and this is the most distant, decent spectrum of any cosmological object. And I show this because the um, Lyman alpha line of hydrogen, which is normally in the ultraviolet, so 1,216 angstroms, is here shifted to the infrared, nearly 10,000 angstroms. The wavelength is 8.1 times stretched by the redshift. And this is an indicator that we're looking back a very long way. This particular object, incidentally, can be observed so relatively easily because it's not just an ordinary galaxy, it's a quasar. It's got not just lots of stars emitting, but it's got in its, in its center a black hole weighing as much as maybe a billion stars, which is gathering up 
gas from its surroundings. This is a simulation of the sort of thing that's happening um, in, this, uh, in this system. And they, that means that these quasars are the most uh, easily detectable things at very high, early times. Black holes, of course, are a great prediction of Einstein's theory. Um, here's uh, Einstein. He's the sort of, this is the sort of benign and unkept kept sage of uh, T-shirts and uh, the posters. Um, but, of course, when he did his great work, he wasn't like that. He was more like this, a rather dapper young man. And it's important to realize that. Um, and, of course, he developed his wonderful theory of general relativity. Black holes were a remarkable prediction. And you may have read that just in the last couple of weeks, another even more remarkable prediction of his uh, the, uh, theory has been uh, uh, confirmed. And this is the production of gravitational waves, which are produced when two black holes spiral together. If two black holes get very close, then they emit sort of radiation. They distort space, and they, uh, and they, they go together. And this produces a sort of ripple going out through space, which slightly changes the separation of two objects. So if the gravitational wave is going this, this way, then uh, this distance will change very slightly. And you can calculate the form of this. So uh, the top is a sketch of uh, uh, different stages and two black holes merging. Um, and at the bottom, this is a calculation of the uh, distortion of space. Um, it's, it increases in amplitude and in frequency as the things spiral together, and then they merge. And then eventually, it, you get what's called the ring down, when the single merged black hole shakes a bit and then settles down to be another quiescent black hole. And the amazing thing is that this has been observed. And it's been observed by two detectors. Uh, about 2,000 miles apart, uh, which look like this. They, they, are, they contain a, um, a, a large vacuum pipe with lasers going along it, and they measure with immense precision the separation of mirrors, one at each end. And they look for the tiny jitter in the, in the separation when the wave goes by. And um, they uh, detected an event, which was reported, I'm sure you saw it in, in last week, and the... Um, the, the two top pictures on left and right sh show the observations from these two different detectors, um, 2,000 miles apart, which indicates not a coincidence like a truck going past or something like that. Um, and uh, um, on the bottom, that shows the result of a simulation uh, which best matches this. And it's uh, m best matched by two black holes, 128 solar masses, 135 solar masses, merging together into one of about 60 solar masses. But what's amazing is the sensitivity. The displacement they're measuring, it's a relative change of 10 to the minus 21. So it's 10 to the minus 16 centimeters change in the distance between these two mirrors, and that's 10 to the minus 8 of the size of an atom. And so in terms of precision, it's like measuring the thickness of a hair at the distance of Alpha Centauri. Really amazing. And um, they expect to have um, events like this happening probably about once, once a month. So we've got to hit hear a lot more about this. And it's a really direct probe that uh, Einstein's theory is right, that space does behave and jitter around, and black holes do have the property that he said. Um, now, the other important arena for, um, for cosmology is the, uh, uh, for, for relativity is cosmology, um, the uh, Big Bang itself. And just to remind you that we have um, uh, the famous discovery more than 50 years ago by these two guys, Penzias Wilson, that the universe isn't completely cold. It's filled with radiation about three degrees above absolute zero. And this radiation has a black body spectrum and is believed to be the relic of the hot, dense beginning of the universe. So we've had for about 30 or 40 years this time chart of the universe, starting off very hot and dense, expanding. After about half a million years, it's cooled down to 3,000 degrees. The hydrogen becomes neutral. After about uh, uh, 200 million years, the first stars form. After about a billion years, the first galaxies form, and they're the ones we see, etc. And um, you might wonder how, from some amorphous beginnings, uh, we end up with a with, with structure, because we're saying the early universe was hot and uniform. This may seem contrary to second law of thermodynamics, which says that structures should, should be uh, washed out. But it's the effect of gravity, because as the universe expands, a region that was originally slightly denser than average is going to lag behind more, and it will eventually condense out. And this is a simulation of that happening. This is a picture indicating a sort of part of the universe in a box 
um, and the expansion is subtracted out, but you see the density contrast growing as time goes on. And the blue represents the dark matter, and the red will represent the, uh, the actual gas which is turning into stars. So starting off with um, uh, a uniform, dense universe, we end up in the expanded universe where structures have condensed out. And lots of calculations like this have been done. And the important point is that you've got to put in fluctuations at the beginning, but the fluctuations you put in um, aren't just chosen at random. They are got from observations. And the observations come from another spacecraft, ESA's Planck's satellite. This satellite discover, uh, studied the background of the universe, uh, uh, background radiation, and uh, this is a map of the whole sky where the, the color-coded are the slightly hotter than average and colder than average ones. So this allows you to say what fluctuations were present. And the satisfying thing is that uh, the um, solid line there is the predicted density contrast as a function of scale if you put in the initial fluctuations observed by Planck. And the, the data in various ways fits that fairly well. So we are onto something in uh, being able to understand uh, how uh, structures form from amorphous beginnings. Well, we'd like to understand what caused the fluctuations, why is the universe expanding the way it is, why does it contain the observed mix of atoms, radiation, and dark matter. And sadly, we can't do this yet. We can trace cosmic history back uh, to a time when everything was hotter and denser than the sun. We can probably trace it back to about a, a nanosecond after the Big Bang. That's when all the particles had about the energy you could produce in the LHC at CERN. And at that time, the observable universe would be squeezed down to the size of the solar system. But, and here I put in a warning sign, uh, these key features of the universe were imprinted, probably, when the universe was uh, much, much, much smaller. When to... Uh, um, when this is real size, when the entire universe was squeezed down to the size of an apple. And there are lots of ideas about how this could have happened. There's an idea called inflation, which uh, can account for many features of the universe. But this is speculative because, of course, we're talking here about uh, physical regimes that can't possibly be simulated in the lab and where we can only um, uh, infer them uh, in a self-consistent way from cosmology. Well, I'm going to have, uh, I've got, what, five more minutes? Yeah, okay. Well, I was, I was going to um, just mention uh, the various things that happen in the expanding universe because um, it's not obvious that starting with this Big Bang, we end up with, uh, with a present universe. We need to have gravity, and uh, the strength of gravity is measured by this famous number. We need to have uh, departure from thermodynamic equilibrium. We need to have um, matter-antimatter asymmetry. So I'm rushing through this rather than cut it out completely because I'm short of time. Uh, we need to have non-trivial chemistry. And this says that we've got to have the balance between the uh, nuclear force and the magnetic force such that we can have a, a periodic table of, uh, of chemical elements. And we need to have some stars. And we also need to have uh, the expansion of the universe such that the universe doesn't collapse before any of this can happen and doesn't expand so fast that gravity, um, can, um, uh, that gravity uh, can't pull these proto-galaxies together. And we don't understand why these conditions are all fulfilled. But there's a speculative idea that even though the laws of nature are the same in the domain we can observe, and you see that goes out to billions of light years, this may be only a tiny and perhaps atypical part of physical reality. Because what we can see is limited by a horizon, how far light has been able to come since the Big Bang. And that horizon is no more real than the horizon around you if you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. You don't think the ocean stops after, uh, after the horizon. Likewise, we don't think the universe stops beyond what we can see. There's probably far more. We don't know how much. Almost certainly it goes 100 times further, um, but it could go so far that all combinatorial options are fulfilled and that out there there's another lecture room like this and you have an avatar and if you make a bad decision, your avatar makes the right decision. So maybe that's some consolation to you. That may happen if the universe goes on far enough. And that's not all, because 
What I've talked about there is the aftermath of our Big Bang. But our Big Bang may not be the only one. There may be many, many others. And this is a picture of an idea called eternal inflation, whereby uh, our universe, depicted there bottom right, is just part of one bubble, one domain in space-time. And then the question is, are these domains all like ours, or are they governed by different laws? If they're governed by different laws, then many would be sterile, because the, uh, or the process I just had in that list uh, may not all happen. So we may be in a, uh, in a uh, universe which is rather lucky in that it allows the complexity to evolve. And uh, one important question for physics is whether fundamental theory does predict uniquely what we call the fundamental constants, the mass of the electron, strength of gravity, etc., or whether um, it allows different variants so that if there are different Big Bangs, they cool down to be different universes. String theorists would say that uh, probably uh, there are a lot of variants um, and that uh, um, therefore we are in just one universe and there are many others governed by different laws. The multiverse idea um, is speculative, um, but many take it seriously. In fact, I was at a conference um, uh, some years ago, where there was a panel discussion about it. We were asked, how seriously did we take it? And uh, I said, well, on the scale, would you bet your goldfish, your dog, or yourself? I was nearly at the dog level. And uh, the other person on the panel was uh, Andre Linde. He was the inventor of that internal inflation idea. He said he'd spent 25 years working on it. He'd bet his life on it. And then Stephen Weinberg, the great theorist, said he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> well, just to uh, uh, a couple of concluding uh, themes, um, uh, if I were to have a logo for this research area, I'd choose this, an Ouroboros, which shows a snake eating its tail, and it shows on the left the micro world of nuclei and uh, atoms, the quantum world, and on the right the uh, uh, role of astronomy, where gravity and Einstein's theory holds sway. And the important thing is that uh, um, chemists and etc. don't need to worry about gravity, because gravity is too weak to be important between the atoms of a molecule. Conversely, if you're an astronomer thinking about the orbits of planets, you don't worry about the quantum fuzziness of those orbits because they're so, um, they're so uh, uh, big. Uh, so there's, it doesn't matter that we don't have a unified theory yet which combines those two. We do need such a theory, though, if we are to settle these speculations about the early universe. We need a theory which is symbolized by uh, gastronomically, as it were, by the snake eating its tail, the very small and the very large, because if we go back to the very beginning of the universe, it's so small that, as it were, quantum fluctuations shake the whole thing. And so to understand what's happening there, we do need this theory. And until we have such a theory, then uh, um, these ideas about the very early universe will be speculative. But before I leave this picture, uh, just one other uh, comment. Um, we have the frontier of the very small on the left, the very large at the right. But 99% of scientists are neither particle physicists nor cosmologists. 99% work on the third frontier, symbolized at the bottom, the very complex. And the most complicated things of all are human beings here. And it, it's interesting that human beings are literally midway between atoms and stars. The geometric mean of the mass of a proton and the mass of the sun is 50 kilograms, within a uh, factor of two, I guess, of the mass of each person here. So uh, we need to understand ourselves by understanding the atoms we're made of, but also to understand the stars that made these atoms. So there's a nice unification, the links between the left-hand side of this picture and the right-hand side. And uh, uh, another bit of sort of modesty for any biologists here, it's biology and complexity, which is far harder than physics and astronomy. This is a famous uh, uh, drawing by uh, Newton's least favorite colleague, Robert Hooke, from the uh, Royal Society's first best-selling book, uh, Hooke's Micrographia. This is a flea seen for the first time and depicted beautifully um, by uh, uh, Hooke uh, when he's seen it through his microscope. And even that has layer upon layer of structure, far more complicated than a star or a galaxy. So uh, it's the very complex, the frontier at the bottom, which is the most challenging one. And astronomy is going to develop uh, through uh, the big instruments um, in uh, the radio there, um, and also optical and in space. 
But I want to finish just by a remark focusing back from uh, the cosmos, even a whole ensemble of cosmoses, to the here and now, the Earth. I'm sometimes asked, do astronomers have a different perspective on everyday matters because of the kind of work they do? Well, I have to say that having lived much of my working life among them, uh, they're no more relaxed and serene about everyday problems than anyone else. They get just as flu flustered about uh, minor matters. But I think there is one respect in which they do have a different perspective. Let me just mention this in conclusion. Unless you live in uh, Kansas or parts of the Muslim world, you're familiar with the idea of where the outcome of uh, three and a half billion years of, of uh, Darwinian selection and evolution, this time chart here. But I think even people familiar with this, as most uh, people are, somehow feel that we humans are the culmination of it all. But no astronomer could believe that, because astronomers know that the sun is less than halfway through its life. This is a sort of our impression time lapse. This is, now is less than halfway through life. So the sun has about five or six billion years ahead, and the entire expanding universe may have an infinite future. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> so there's plenty of time for post-human evolution. Any creature witnessing the end of the sun and sending this postcard, they won't be human. They'll be as different, be as different from us as we will be from a bug because there's more time between now and then than has been since uh, the solar system formed. Moreover, as I already mentioned, future evolution is going to take place not on the slow Darwinian timescale, where it takes a million years at least for a species to evolve and then become extinct. It'll happen on a technological timescale, here on Earth and perhaps far away. And so even if there's no life out there in space already, then there's plenty of time for life from the Earth to spread through the galaxy and beyond. So we need to be cosmically modest, uh, even if uh, life is unique to us. And so uh, uh, I think we've got to realize that the time spans lying ahead are just as prolonged as the time scales of the past that have led to our emergence. But having said all that, even in this concertina perspective, stretching billions of years into the past and into the future, there's something special about this century. The Earth existed for 45 million centuries. But this is the first when one species, ours, has the future of the planet in its hands. This has never happened before. We've entered an era called the Anthropocene. And it'll be up to what happens here on Earth in this century, whether we cope with all the problems of uh, population, climate change, and uh, misuse of technology, which will determine whether all these future prospects are foreclosed or whether we are a step towards them. And I think uh, that's a good step, uh, a good point on which to end uh, and to remind everyone that this pale blue dot in the cosmos is something which we occupy uh, at a special time as well as it being a special place. Thank you very much. Speakers agreed to take questions. If you wish to ask a question, raise your hand. And one well, of these two gentlemen will bring the microphone. Oh, first question here. Yes. <coughs> question. <coughs> no? yes, About our particular Big Bang, our particular universe, I wasn't quite clear about its size. Did you? Uh, because it's about 14 billion years old, mm -hmm. approximately. Yes, yes. But I understand its diameter is actually around about 40 billion years. Did you say it could be infinite? Because how can it be infinite in a finite time? And does that mean there is a finite mass, if you like, for the original big, our Big Bang, and it's simply spread out? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, it, it could be infinite. I think most people bet that it is finite, but hugely larger than the region we can observe. The simplest model of the universe, devised by Einstein, were of infinite universes. But I think uh, most people would say that it is uh, um, finite, but much bigger um, 
at least 100 times bigger than what we can see. The reason I say that is that um, the Planck spacecraft um, didn't find any difference, even to level of 1,010 to the fifth between the radiation in that direction and the radiation in that direction. So that suggests that if we're in some finite structure, the gradient across it is very small, indicating it's probably much bigger than what we can see. So that's all we can say. We can say it's much bigger than what we can see, but we can't say how much. Next question. Yes, sir. Is gravity a consequence of mass, or is it a consequence of rotation, sir? Consequence of what? Of rotation. Of rotation. Uh, well, I mean, it's affected by both. I mean, according to, according to Einstein, uh, um, uh, mass gives, uh, uh, space tells matter how to move, matter tells space how to curve. That's the mantra of, uh, uh, of Einstein's theory. Um, and uh, so any kind of mass uh, can cause uh, space curvature, which manifests itself as gravity. Um, and a spinning object has a slightly different gravitational effect from a non-spinning object. And uh, black holes, for instance, uh, uh, if they're spinning, they have different metrics from uh, non-spinning ones. Can I ask mm. another question, sir? Is the universe spinning? Uh, is there any evidence ah. to prove it or not? Uh, there's, uh, no, there's a pretty good upper limit, because again, there's a, the, transverse do the transverse Doppler effects would mean, if it was spinning, that you get a, a, a different redshift um, if you looked in the equatorial plane, or if you looked along the poles of the rotation. And there's no effect like that. So there are pretty strong upper limits on any global rotation, even though things in the universe, the galaxies obviously are rotating, but the universe as a whole has no systematic rotation and there's strong upper limits on that. And my last question, sir. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we know that the, the universe is expanding and the expansion is going faster and faster. And is there a measure, can we actually measure how fast we are expanding? Well, that's what the redshift tells you, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Question. Other questions? Might go on. And then. Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, can I ask you a question about um, do you believe that there has been any other civilizations before human beings came around on this earth? Um, well, I mean, I, I think want to be open-minded about all these things, um, uh, I bet it's unlikely, but we can't rule it out. Um, because uh, one thing we do know uh, is that there are many stars which are um, one or two billion years older than the sun and which could have had planets around them like the Earth. And you would think that any life on those would have had a head start in its evolution. Um, and many people say it's rather surprising that if life is at all widespread, we haven't seen ev evidence of uh, life from elsewhere getting here before we can get to them. So it is a bit surprising to some people that uh, we haven't seen any evidence for other life. Um, but most people would say we haven't got any firm evidence. Next, last question. Uh -oh. um, so with the cosmic microwave background, we've learned a lot about the early universe. Now that we've perhaps opened our ears to gravitational background through gravitational waves, presuming we had a detector sensitive enough, something like Lisa Pathfinder or an evolution of that, yes. what do you think that that kind of background could tell us about the very early universe? Um, well, of course, uh, you may remember there was a, a hyped up false alarm a year or two ago uh, when it was claimed that just that had been found, gravitational waves which were, were produced um, in the initial inflationary phase which would have been very exciting because it would have told us something about the universe at this incredibly early time when it was literally that big. Um, now, that observation uh, was uh, uh, premature, but nonetheless, um, uh, future experiments may detect um, this uh, uh, gravitational wave background, um, either directly via uh, LIGO or its follow-ups, or um, by uh, measurements of the microwave background, where um, by studying the polarization, uh, if, if you get a sort of a curl in the, in the polarization rather than just, uh, rather than just divergence, that's an indication of gravitational waves. So it is something which is being studied. And if we can detect a gravitational wave background, that will be one thing that is going to be a direct clue of the very early universe. Because what makes gravitational waves hard to detect is that they go through everything and have very small cross sections. But the upside of that is that they come to us directly from the first tiny, tiny fraction of a second of the universe if they're created then. So they are direct probes of the very early universe. And so um, watch this space. 
Okay, that's the last question, except one I'd like to ask. Um, Fred Hoyle wrote a book, was it The Black Cloud? Yes. Uh, is that a good introduction for the layperson to the non-human Well, I, I think um, I, th that was Fred Hoyle's first and best science fiction book. Uh -huh. uh, the hero is a handsome version of Fred Hoyle. Um, and uh, uh, the idea, if you haven't read the book, uh, is that uh, uh, there is an alien intelligence which is in effect a magnetized interstellar cloud which approaches the Earth and is about to engulf the Earth. And I think it's important that we should be open-minded that uh, intelligence need not take the biological form that we're used to. Um, I mentioned that it could be uh, uh, obviously something like a, a, a hyper-advanced computer, but it could be something like that. So Fred Hoyle's uh, book was very imaginative um, and uh, as you not dismissed, he had the, the idea that you could have complicated signals uh, within this magnetized cloud. I think any entity like that would think very slowly because it would be very large and signals would travel slowly mm -hmm. across it. But it was not a crazy idea and it uh, just indicated what a remarkably imaginative man Fred Hoyle was. And that was his first science right. fiction book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, uh, the Lindsay Lecture concludes with a vote of thanks. Um, our speaker has mentioned distances which are almost impossible to imagine. Uh, for those of us whose major departure from terra firma is going upstairs to bed. <laughs> but um, we have, in fact, uh, with us um, the person who was the first Briton in space. So it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Helen Sharman to propose a vote of thanks. Lord Rees, if we didn't know before, we can all now truly appreciate uh, why you're in such high demand to give talks. I mean, I know that you have an incredibly busy, busy schedule, you travel the world, um, and we're truly grateful for you to co for coming here to Imperial College in London tonight. Um, it's inspirational to be with you in person, and um, I'd like to say that I think we can all agree you tonight you have done more good than harm, certainly. I mean, um, others actually may not be aware quite how versatile you are. We, we last met, um, Lord Rees and I, at the Science Museum as part of a, a very light-hearted discussion panel on the various merits of, um, of um, sending robots, you know, robotic use in space um, versus human spaceflight. And uh, actually, then you mentioned this post-human, technologically involved species. And we weren't able to explore the topic very well that night. And I'm just really, really grateful that we've had that, a bit of opportunity. Um, I'm certainly going to give that an awful lot more thought. When I'm asked, you know, did you see an alien in space? My stock response is usually, I don't know what do you think one looks like. But you know, I've got a much better response now, having heard what you say to people. So I shall, uh, I shall refine my response now. Astronauts love looking out of the window, of course, at the Earth, but also at the stars. Of course, making windows in spacecraft is very expensive. It'd be much better and much cheaper if you can build, build spacecraft without the bother of making the windows. But the humans don't like the idea of going to space without being able to look out of the window. Of course, robots wouldn't be quite as demanding, I'm sure. But um, it's this whole concept of, you know, we look out of that window, and what do you see? You, know, you look at the Earth, of course, but you look away from the Earth. And at first, your eyes don't see anything because you're you know, accustomed to the bright lights inside the space station, maybe of that reflection of light from Earth. But if you can get to be around the opposite side of the Earth to the sun and then look at the stars, and gradually, as your eyes become accustomed to the darkness, of course, then you do start to see those stars. And it does appear as those, those stars go on and on and on. And it's a thick kind of blanket but, you know, we all know, of course, that our eyes alone are nothing um, when we're looking at you know, the scales that you've spoken of tonight, billions of light years. Um, and I think the whole concept as well of having multiple big bangs just makes me really confirm to, to how insignificant we are as individuals, how insignificant our planet actually is on some of the scales we've heard about tonight. You've shown us some amazing pictures, you know, the... Um, the Kepler orrery has to be one of my favourites tonight. Um, crashing galaxies, we, we've had all sorts of images. Um, this and so much more, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm very glad that you think that engineers and scientists will continue to find mutual benefit 
um, on space missions. So this collaborative approach is going to really get the best results for everyone. Um, I'm sure Professors Bob Spence here, um, Eric Yateman, the head of the, um, the Department of Electrical and Electronic, and Electric, Electrical and Electronic Engineering, I'll get it right, Eric, tonight. Um, I'm sure they're very happy to hear that they're not going to be put out of their jobs very soon by um, theoretical scientists either. But you've provided us food for thought about future areas of investigation, which I think is going to be really inspirational for many people here tonight. Um, more insight into the cosmos, into our part in it. Notwithstanding all that scientific content, we have been simultaneously entertained tonight. And that is not an easier job as, Lord Rees, you make it appear to be. It's just been a great pleasure to listen to you. So on behalf of the audience here and Imperial College London, for a wonderful evening of insight, good humour and thought, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That concludes the evening's proceedings. Thank you for coming.